Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, one of the things that I love about this thing that we have been doing with River Tree, I think this is the third time now that we've kind of swapped uh, pastors, so to speak. If you didn't know, PC is, is at the branch this morning. And um, one of the things that I love about it is that for me personally, it reminds me that the church is capital C. Does that make sense? It's so easy for me um, as a pastor, certainly, but I think this happens to all of us to some extent. We, we think of church as our unique expression that we're a part of. And so for you all, it's River Tree, right? That's church. And that's not a bad thing to think of it in that way, but every once in a while, it's good to kind of lift our heads up and realize that God is at work in the church, capital C, all over the world. And even in neighboring suburban areas like Wyoming and Granville and Byron Center. And so one of the things I love about coming here is seeing that truth, that God is at work in you. I love that. And I, it doesn't take more than a couple minutes to get in the door and start talking with you and hear about how God is at work. In simple, faithful ways like, my kids are growing up. You know, that's God at work. And I get to hear about that from you. Or this thing happened at my job, you know, or whatever. As we talk and as I come here, it's just this great reminder that God is at work all over the place. And so let's celebrate that together this morning. It's not what I came to preach about, though, uh, interestingly enough. It may sound like it, but it's not. Um, we're... We're in this series um, called Bless From This House. You'll notice the title of this series is not Bless This House. Although we could have done a series on that, you know, Bless This House. That, that would have been okay. But when we read the Bible, one of the themes that we see woven in and out of its pages is that God is a God who loves to bless people, individuals and families and even entire nations. God loves to bless people because God is good. Yes? Just not, not because of anything we've done, but just because God is good. God loves to bless people. But God's expectation in that blessing is that we would receive it and then give it away again. So what you see in the Bible is this consistent theme that we are blessed to be a blessing, right? One of the clearest examples of this is um, in Genesis 12. A guy named Abram, who later becomes Abraham. You've probably heard of this guy, right? God comes to Abram and says, I'm going to bless you. Now, Abram at this point has done nothing to des really deserve or earn blessing because that's, again, not the point. God blesses us just because God is good. God comes to Abram and says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. So we come to, from, from this, travel all throughout the scriptures, we get to Jesus. Very beginning of his ministry, Matthew 5, he takes his disciples up on a mountain and he begins to teach them. And what we see Jesus doing is the same thing that we see God doing with Abram. Teaching them about how God blesses us because God is just good and love and grace. But we are blessed so that we might be a blessing. In fact, Jesus teaches his disciples about this uh, in Matthew 5. It's called the Beatitudes. Anybody heard that expression before? Yeah? There was a video at the beginning if you, if you maybe caught that too. I always used to think that the Beatitudes were about our attitude. Anybody else? Like, oh, this is about our, well, and, and it is. It is about our attitudes, but that's not why it's called the Beatitudes. This is a great cocktail trivia. You'll love to pull this out with your friends. It comes from a Latin word called Beatudo. So just pull that out the next time you're making small talk. Hey, if you didn't know. Um, and it means, Beatudo in Latin means blessed. So this section in Matthew 5 is about blessing. And Jesus has 10 statements, 10 beatitudes about whom God blesses and how that blessing allows those people to be a blessing. 
And what we're specifically doing in this series, as the title would imply, is we are talking about being a blessing from the vantage point of our home. From our home. You can look at the Beatitudes from all kinds of angles. What we're doing in this series is looking at it from the angle of our house. What does it mean for you and your home to be a blessing? What would that look like for your house to both be blessed but to be a blessing as well? And for even in a group of this size, the word house or home is going to mean different things. Yes? For some of you, um, you are married. And so your house, your home is going to certainly involve your spouse. Please, make sure it involves your spouse, right? Okay. Yep, right? Some of you have kids. Some of you have stepkids. Some of you don't. That's going to influence what home means for you. Some of you have other family members living with you right now. We actually have, in my home, we have four kids of our own. And now we have my niece and his two parents, my brother and his wife living with us for about a month. So home for us, at least for a short little period, means them as well, right? They're included in that. So it's going to look different for each of us. What would it mean for you and for your home, your house, to be a blessing? That's what we're talking about in this series. All right, so there's Abraham again. Let's do this before we go any further. I want to read Matthew 5, these Beatitudes together. But instead of um, me reading them, I want us to read them together. So here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to read the first part of every Beatitude. And then in the first one, this would be the example. God blesses those who are poor, or as uh, PC talked last week, poor in spirit and, and needs and their need for them. I'm going to read that first part, and then you're going to read, For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Right? And we'll do that with everyone. We'll kind of walk through them one by, you know, kind of bit by bit. And that way we can do this together, which I think the word of God is meant to be read together um, as often as possible. So let's, will you do that with me? Out loud, I know it's scary, but let's, let's read out loud together. Um, just to be clear, this is not to be done silently. Let's read out loud together, all right? All right. So here's the first one. God blesses those who are poor and their need for him. God blesses those who mourn. Okay. God blesses those who are humble. Hmm. Ben's got that one coming up here in a couple weeks. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. God blesses those who are merciful. God blesses those whose hearts are pure. God blesses those who work for peace. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. Powerful and deep is this little section of Matthew 5. And today, we're just going to look at one of those. It was back in verse 6. We'll get to it in just a second. But I want to I tell a story um, first. A number of years ago, there was a movie made about those test pilots who first tried to break through the sound barrier seems so obvious to us that this is normal, but not that long ago, 40, 50 years ago, there were many people who didn't believe that the sound barrier could be broken. They just didn't think it was possible. The physics didn't add up. And so they, they said, you're crazy for even trying. But of course, there are some always some crazy people in the world and there were some test pilots and they were like, no, it can be done. And so they would take off in these planes and they would get to the point of the sound barrier, and for the first half a dozen or so who tried it, the plane would either shake uncontrollably from the forces put upon it, and it would literally just fall apart, or 
the pilots would try and control the plane as they normally would, and the plane wouldn't behave as they would expect, and they would crash. Something funny was happening around the sound barrier. And then one pilot kind of took a risk, was, was trying to figure it out, and, and made this assumption that right, right at the point of breaking through the sound barrier, the controls of the plane actually would work backwards. So instead of pulling back on the stick to go up, you would push it forward. Now that's crazy, right? When you're flying 700 plus miles an hour to just go, well, let's try it, you know? <laughs> But he did. And sure enough, the controls did function differently at that point, and he was able to break through the sound barrier. So that's what this movie was, it was retelling the story. Well, Chuck Yeager, who was the first person to actually break through the sound barrier, was interviewed about this movie, and they asked him, w is this the way that it you know, actually went down? He was like, no, no. <laughs> that's not quite the way it went down. But nonetheless, I still think it's a great story. And, um, and it actually really illustrates well um, what I think is happening here in these Beatitudes. I think, I think what's happening in this section of the Bible is that Jesus is saying to us that, you know, the world, the world tells us that you have to fly a certain way, that the controls of this life kind of operate a certain way. I'm actually telling you that it's completely backwards to fly and to break through into new, a place where you've never been before, you have, to, you have to fly backwards, upside down. Because our world tells us, does it not, that the rich are the ones who are blessed. Right? Our world tells us that it is the powerful who is, who is blessed. Blessed are those who will do anything to get ahead, our world says. Blessed are those focused on themselves. Blessed are the ones who make sure they are happy. But what Jesus is telling us is that actually, these are the people who are blessed. Jesus is kind of, with this teaching, breaking through the sound barrier. He's bringing us into a place where we haven't been before. And he says, guess what? This place where I'm bringing you, the kingdom of God, it is backwards. It is upside down. It is not what you expect. So get ready. Because here are the people who are blessed. Again, I have four kids. 10, 9, 7, 5. Often my kids, um, not often, that, that sounds like we're way more spiritual than we actually are. Sometimes my kids ask us about heaven. <laughs> they want to know some things about it. I think we all want to know about heaven, actually. Just that kids are brave enough to ask the question out loud. So, Dad, where's heaven? You know? Dad, if I got in a rocket ship and flew off to the farthest place in the, you know, would, would we get to heaven? And we're like, No. Actually, you wouldn't. Because heaven isn't out there somewhere on the distant edge of the galaxy. Heaven, Jesus teaches us, is right here. Heaven and earth. Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand. It's come. It's near. It's within reach. And so in our home, we often talk about a veil or a curtain that kind of separates heaven and earth. And we say to our kids, every once in a while, the, the veil gets pulled back. And heaven comes to earth. Like when you were born, Josiah, we say. When you were born, the veil got pulled back and heaven came to earth. Heaven and earth actually overlap and interlock. It's just that we don't have eyes and ears to see it. And Jesus comes and helps, helps pull back the curtain. He said, teaches us to pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The two are supposed to become completely one. So anyway... We have these conversations with our kids and, and our kids want to know where it is and they want to know, you know, what is heaven like? And we say to them, well, it has nothing to do with harps or clouds, floating on clouds or eating Philadelphia cream cheese, you know, you know right? This is heaven. You want to know what heaven looks like? This is what heaven looks like. 
Because what Jesus is describing here is what life looks like when God's will is done. And wherever God's will is done, that's where heaven is. So this is heaven. This is heaven. And what we are invited to do as sons and daughters of the king, as disciples of Jesus, what we are invited to do is to live our lives in such a way so that everything that we do, including our homes, our houses, help bring heaven to earth. Help live like this. And so today, again, we're going to look at one of these Beatitudes, verse 6. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Or your translation may have it, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Anyone here ever been guilty of a late night snack? There's the one in the back too, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm admitting it, you know. Right around 9.30, it's usually something sweet that I'm after. Right? 3.30, wow. <laughs> yeah, because you're, you're on a different shift, is that why? Or you're just early. Yeah, right, good. So there you go, right in the middle of the night. Um, you know, you all know what this is like, and you all know that these, these like late night snacks we have are these snacks that happen out of the rhythm of our normal meals. It's not that we're, we're like desperately hungry in those moments, right? It's just like, yeah, I could eat something. You know, it kind of sounds good, right? But we're not desperately hungry. And what Jesus is talking about here with hunger and thirst, when you look at the Greek, is that the, the kind of hunger and thirsting that Jesus is, is speaking about is a desperate hunger and thirst. This is someone who hasn't had a drink for a couple of days and is just longing for a drink of water. This is someone who has not eaten for a week and would, would eat dirt if it, you know, if it brought any, they would eat anything. They're so hungry. Jesus says the kind of people who have that kind of hunger for justice, for righteousness, they are blessed. They are blessed. Now let me make two observations about that kind of hunger and thirst, the desperate kind, the like, I, I can't think about anything but food or water, right? Let me make a couple of observations about that kind of hunger and thirst. First, whatever you are hungry and thirsty for, that thing, that appetite will demand your attention. Do you know what I'm talking about? you've all been hungry. Now in America, you know, chances are probably good. It's not been more than three hours, but we tell ourselves we're starving, right? You've been there. You know what it's like to be hungry and you can't think about anything else. It demands your attention. In fact, our bodies are wired in, in such a way that if, if you don't feed yourself right away, what does your stomach actually do? Yeah, it starts to make noises like, hey, Pay attention to me, you know? I've been sending signals to your brain and you're not doing anything about it, so I'm just going, blah, 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 right? It's weird, but it's like, I'm not going to let you off the hook here. I, I demand your attention. Our minds and our hearts are the same way. Whatever you have set your heart on, whatever you are hungry for in this life, it will demand your attention. So that's the first observation. The second is this. Our appetites drive us to action. So you, whatever you're hungry for, it's all you can think about. You wake up in the morning, it's on your brain, right? It, it's demanding your attention, but it will ultimately drive you to do something about it. Because if you've ever been really hungry or thirsty before, I mean like desperately hungry or thirsty, do you just say to yourself, eh, I'll get to it later. You might do that with like the late night snack kind of hunger, but not a desperate hunger and thirst. You're going to do something about it. You're going to find water if it's the last thing that you do. It will demand that you do something about it, which is why you and I can look around this world. Not just around the world. We can look at the cubicle next to us and the person on the factory line next to us and we can look at our own hearts and see all kinds of people doing all kinds of things 
and buying all kinds of things and believing all kinds of things in the hope of having that hunger met. Right? We will try and feed whatever we are hungry for. And so Jesus comes to us and essentially asks us here, what are you hungering after? God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. What does Jesus mean by justice? That's a big word, isn't it? Just like law and order, you know, Jesus is going to, is that what this is? What, what does Jesus mean by justice? This is the Greek word diakosune, blah, 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 who really cares? Here's the deal, you know, it, it means righteousness, which is why a lot of translations put it as such. But the gist of this Greek word is that last bullet point. Things as they should be. And so you could translate this verse this way, I think. A lot of ways. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for things as they should be. Or you could put it that God blesses those who hunger and thirst for heaven. Because heaven is the place where things are as they should be. Or you could say that God blesses those who hunger and thirst for God and God's ways, for they will be satisfied. Because heaven is the place where God is and where God's ways are carried out, right? So I'm just trying to put it in some different language because I think the word justice can be like a little, well, what does that actually mean? Well, it means that we're longing after, we're hungering for things as they should be. And friends, you know how things should be. Or at least you know, you know it when things are not the way that they should be. Do you not? You can just, you feel it. You know it. We're wired that way. When we see something that is unjust, we know it. Jesus says, man, if you are pursuing things as they should be, if that's what you're chasing after and hungering for, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. So let me ask this question. What would your life look like if you were hungering and thirsting for things as they should be? And just think concretely for a moment. It's a very big question. Try and make it specific to your life. Like, you're going to get up tomorrow morning. Yes? Probably? Likely anyway. At some point, you're going to wake up here again soon. And um, what do you normally do when you wake up? Like, what are the first few things you do in a day? And then let me ask this question. Would, they look, would those things look any differently if you were someone who was hungering and thirsting for God? What would your first conversation of the day look like? Would it be any different if you were hungering and thirsting for God? I am a grouch in the morning, so for me, the answer is yes. My first conversation would look differently if I was hungering and thirsting after God. What would it look like for the way that you treat your neighbor if you were hungering and thirsting for heaven? Would your attitude at work change if you were hungering and thirsting for God and God's ways? Would your driving behavior change shift in any way if you are hungering and thirsting like like let's get concrete about this because that's what jesus wants is for us to like actually become concrete about these really big ideas you know what would it look like for your house your home to hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness see jesus tells us that this is the way to become satisfied. That when we pursue God and God's ways, we end up full. Do you remember the last time that you were really hungry? And by this point in the message, I know you guys are all like, oh my gosh, I'm so hungry now because you keep talking about food all the time. Last one, promise. Remember, just try and think back to the last time you were really hungry. 
Can you remember sitting down to finally eat? And how, how good everything tasted? And then finally you reached the point in the meal where you didn't need to eat anymore. Right? Like Thanksgiving is this way for me. I love Thanksgiving. You know? This huge feast and everything is so good I want to eat it all and I usually do. But there does come a point when I can't eat anymore. I don't want to eat anymore. I'm, I'm full. I'm satisfied. That's what Jesus is talking about here. That when we chase after heaven concretely in our everyday lives, we become full. We stop hungering and thirsting and chasing after other things because we don't want anything else. We're, we're content. So let's, let's take a step back and let's think about what Jesus is saying here from kind of a, a, a big perspective. And then we're going to make it concrete again. But everything starts out with the fact that we are blessed. Not because we've earned it, but because God is good. And so God just blesses us because that's who our God is. When we are blessed, we end up hungering and thirsting for justice. When you receive the grace of God, it changes your heart and you start hungering and thirsting after things that are actually like worthy of being chased after. And when you hunger and thirst for justice, friends, I promise you it will end up blessing other people. You can't pursue heaven without blessing other people. And as you bless other people, yes, you will be blessed. And the cycle continues. The more blessed you are, the more you hunger and thirst. The more you hunger and thirst for justice, the more you bless people, and on and on it goes. And this is how we end up satisfied and full and content. And so... Let's do this to end this morning. Nearby on a chair, somewhere close, hopefully, is a little square sheet of paper. And it has the, the series kind of logo on it. Blessed from this house. I'm going to have just leave a couple of minutes here for us to quietly reflect on two questions. If you have a pen, uh, I would encourage you to, to maybe jot a couple of things down here, an idea or two to take away this morning. I think there are some pens on the back table if you want to get up and grab one. I know for me it's really helpful to get things out of my head and onto a piece of paper. It makes it concrete and, and out of the abstract. So here's the first question. What would it look like for more of heaven to come to the part of earth that your house touches? So think about your home, your house, and it's in a particular geographic location, yes. What would it look like for more of heaven to come to your street? What would it look like if heaven came more, more fully in your neighborhood? My hunch is it will have something to do with relationship because heaven is all about relationship. So maybe it, it might be as simple as well, if heaven came to my street, we would actually all know each other. And actually, I don't know any of my neighbors, or I know one, you know. But that may be a really simple way that heaven would come more fully, is that your street would be in more relationship. Or maybe there's a specific need for a neighbor next door, a single mom, a, a family that's struggling financially. And you, uh, These are not things you need to solve, by the way. Um, you're just trying to think through what would it look like if heaven came more? to the place where you live, to the place where your house touches others. Maybe it's not your street or your neighborhood, but maybe you have a lot of people into your home, in and out for a variety of reasons. Would, would something be different for those people that come in and out of your home if you were, as a house, pursuing heaven more? Just jot, jot some things down. Write a note or two. Try and imagine what it would look like if heaven came to earth in your home more than it does right now. I'll give you a few, few moments to do that.
For some of us, this is a question we've never asked before. And so it may take uh, some time, more than just a couple of moments here on a Sunday to think through this, which is why there are these pieces of paper. I want to encourage you to take it home and tape it to your mirror in your bathroom or put it on your car seat so that throughout this week you're going to see it and, and be reminded to ask this question of, of what it would look like if heaven came more and more to earth through your home. Okay, so that's a picture of, you, hopefully you have some sense of, well, this, is, this is how things might be different. So then here's the final question. What is one thing you can do to start making this reality a reality? What is one, just one thing, not ten, one. One step you could take to bring heaven more to earth through your home. And if, if the thing that you had that would be different would be that your neighbors would know each other, well, could one step be that this week you would take a walk down your street and either knock on a door or have an intentional conversation with a neighbor who's outside mowing their lawn? Or, I mean, it, right? We're, we're not trying to save the world here in one fell swoop. It's just one step. What, what's one thing that you could do this week? So give that a moment of reflection. Ask God to lead you in that and for the Holy Spirit to, to prompt you in a certain way. And then jot that down too if, if something comes to mind. We'll take a moment to do that. Again, this may take a few days, maybe a week, maybe a couple weeks for you to kind of process through. So if you're sitting there going, I don't, I don't have any idea, don't be discouraged by that. Just make this your prayer this week. God, what would it look like for heaven to come here through my home and what's one thing I could do about it? My wife and I moved to a home about a year ago um, and we know two neighbors but no one else. And so I preached this last week at the branch, this sermon. And um, we got done, and she said, I think we need to buy some ice cream. And I was like, I'm all for it. Yep, I'll head to the store right now. She's like, no, 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 I, I think we need to buy some ice cream and invite our neighbors over. So we're going to do that. We're going to buy like a couple tubs of ice cream, make up a simple invitation. Who can make it can make it. You know, we're not going to stress out about it. And we're going to see who comes over, you know. Formal, we'll spend an hour together, and it's just, it's a simple step we're trying to take to be a blessing from our home. And so what I want to do is I want to pray for all of the things that were thought about in these last three or four minutes and ask that God would carry those things through to completion if, in fact, those are things that God is telling us to do. And for those of us who aren't sure what in the world we should do, that God would bring clarity and wisdom and discernment about those things. So would you pray with me as we close? Here. Anyway. God, the place to start is by saying thank you. <laughs> As we've done through music and, and now through your word, now we're doing through prayer, we, we want to just say thank you because we recognize, God, that you bless us for no good reason. <laughs> Not because of anything we've done, but just because you are good. And you are love and you are grace. And so you just pour out your blessing on our lives. And we thank you for that. And as a way of saying thank you, God, I pray that you would help each person here today take the blessing that they've been given and use it to be a blessing. That you would show us, God, how to bless other people right from our home. 
We don't have to travel halfway around the world. We don't even have to go downtown to a soup kitchen. Right where we are, our home, our house, can be a light to the world. Show us how to do that this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.